Good morning, and welcome to the Arlington Adventist Church. We hope you are truly blessed, blessed from the from your worship experience this morning, and we glad you have chosen to worship with us today. We would we would especially like to welcome our new member, Abby Sutton, who will be baptized today. As we prepare our hearts for worship, I'd like to share from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conduct be with, without conventuousness, be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. May you hear God's words as you experience his glory this morning. Happy Sabbath. Aubrey. We, we are glad to be here and to be, and to be able to, to praise God with all of you. In the Bible, we can find thousands of promises from God to us. All of, all of God's promises are a precious gift to anyone who believes and follows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Our first song is, please join us in singing, standing on the promises.
for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will sh strengthen you, yes, I'll, uh, I'll strengthen you, yes, I'll hold you with, with, with my righteous right hand. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Nevertheless, we are according to his promise. Look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Let's pray. 
Thank you for your promises to us and for your amazing plan of salvation. Please send your Holy Spirit to guide us every day. We are glad to be here and invite you to be with us as we worship you. Thank you for all your blessings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much there, Liam. I really appreciate it. You know, it is always a treat when we have our little ones here today. And today, of course, we've got Burton Academy. We've got fourth and fifth graders and everything that are here together today uh, to lead us in worship. And it, I've already been blessed. You know, some, folks need to pay attention to this sometimes. Sometimes folks get this idea that, you know, that, you know, service should be very orderly and structured and no. It should be respectful of God. And uh, that's not always something that's orderly and structured. It is something that's spontaneous, like just sitting down in the middle of the program, you know? Yeah, the, Jesus was the one who told us, unless you become like little children, you will have no part of his kingdom. That is an openness to the goodness of God. And that's what we've been looking at in this series, Held by God. So I'd like you to take this opportunity and to extend the greeting to one another. I've got everything I need because God's got me. Before I came up on stage, before I came up on stage, our stage manager told me, let's wait for the crowd or for the, you know, for the church to quiet down a little bit before you start talking. And then I realized that might be a while if I don't kind of interject here. Um, what a joyful Sabbath it is. Our mission moment um, of this morning is focused on men's ministry, and um, I've been here at the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church since 1997. Um, I don't, <laughs> one of the kids went, what? <laughs> um, I, I say that not to brag, but I say that to give you a little bit of context um, about my men's ministry experience, which started even before I became a man as a young teenager going to Burton Academy and being involved here at the uh, in youth group and those kinds of things. I thought of, um, I thought of uh, canoe trips and prayer conferences that Pastor Kevin took us on when he was a youth pastor um, and some of those conversations that he had with us immature uh, young men, um, good, fun conversations, and, some, and a lot of deep ones, too. I thought of Harry Royal, who asked me to be a youth elder before I thought I was old enough to have elder attached to my name, and took the time to explain to me what it meant to be an elder and why it's important to have an elder, have elders in the church. I thought of the Burton principals and teachers and coaches who poured into me and didn't only teach me math and teach me basketball, but teach me how to be a man, how to be a Christian man, how to make better choices when I messed up with, in, a, in a loving way. I thought about my college roommates and my singing buddies in college. I thought about Joshua's men, the, the men's leadership group that Pastor Tom started while he was here that I was so lucky to be a part of when we could spend focused time on developing ourselves. I thought of my softball buddies. I thought of my jogging buddies, Venner and Gerald. Um, and all these memories and things uh, started to, you know, kind of flood back. And it wasn't in the middle of any of those times that I really realized what 
how impactful those times would be to me. Um, I, had, <clears throat> I had thought that men's ministry was something really formal. And it was in crisis that I realized what all of that meant when, when people would sit with me and cry with me and bring my family food without even knocking on the door um, and have a burger with me or try and make me laugh or just get me out of the house. Um, and those relationships lifted my family up when I couldn't. And so <clears throat> I didn't intend to uh, become emotional, but I realized that it's in, it's in all those small moments that is what men's ministry is. It's not, um, it's not a f really formal thing. It doesn't have to be. There's a part of that that's that. It's not a, a cold thing, but that it's about relationships. And, so, and that is why I'm passionate about men's ministry, is because that is why I'm here. Not just at this church, but here at all. And so, and so I'm excited to be a part of the men's ministry as we, get, as we kind of kick off for this year. There's been a lot of prayer and thought. Church leadership is um, very excited as well. Um, and we have a prayer, uh, uh, not a prayer breakfast, just a, just a men's uh, ministry breakfast. We want to invite all of the men to on April 20 from 8.30 to 10.30. Um, it's a come and go. You can come and stay as long as you want or as short as you want. We want you to be able to go to your Sabbath schools and your church services um, and, and be able to do that. But please come and join us. And our offering call is also for men's ministry. We'll, um, we'll need some support for that. Uh, Texas Vision as well as our focus, which is on evangelism throughout Texas and, and in our educational institutions. But as you think about offering this morning, please, especially men of the church, think about the offerings you give from your heart. Thank you all of those of you who have so strengthened me and impacted me in that way. And think about how we can do that for one another as we kick off our men's ministry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for... Um, the whole church, uh, but today, thank you so much for the men of the church, for the relationships that you put in our lives to impact us, to guide us, and to lift us up. We love you and we praise you. We ask that you'll guide our men's ministry. May we be the men that you want us to be. Bless our, off our tithes and offerings. Uh, multiply them. Use them how you best see fit to impact uh, our community and world for your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, stay seated. We're going to have that baptism and be able to celebrate together. So stay seated, and then after the baptism, then we'll have our children's story. Good morning. Once again, happy Sabbath. You know, by design, every Sabbath is a special moment in time because it's holy time that God has blessed. But some Sabbaths are, well, they're extra special. When we get to do things like, uh, we get to do things like baptisms or baby dedications. And today we get to do a baptism here. Joining me in the baptistry is young Miss Abby Sutton. Now, Abby has been a member here for, how old are you now, Abby? Uh, 14. You're 13? Yeah. 13? 13? That's crazy, because I remember when you were like little times. Exactly. And so Abby has known this church as her home church since she was born. And it has been a joy. Yeah, I was born. You were born, yes. And it has been wonderful to see her grow 
here in this church. And what has also been wonderful is to be able to see her mom, Karen, who's back here, and her dad, Jesse. I'm not sure where Jesse is. Where are you at, Jesse? Okay, right here, Jesse, center line. Uh, to see them raise her in a way that is pleasing in God's sight. Now, you couldn't have been, you didn't know, but this was closed back here. It had a little hook, and I was trying to figure it out. And Abby was very insistent, my dad's going to open that. My dad is going to open that because her father has been a, either a deacon or an elder here at this church for many years. A deacon. He's been a deacon. Thank you for correcting me there. <laughs> <laughs> and so she knew, Jesse, she knew that you were going to take care of things. So I asked permission to help you out there by unhooking that, and she gave it to me. So that's why we're here today. But we're here today uh, to baptize Abby. And as I always do, I ask, you know, why do you want to be baptized? And Abby just told me a few moments ago, the reason she wants to be baptized is because she loves Jesus. And um, I've heard lots of people say things as to why they're getting baptized. They want to let go of their sins. They want a new life. But this was one of the deepest truths that anybody has ever shared, just because she loves Jesus. And so, Abby, that's why we're here. So... Abby, Abby, I'm going to ask you. Oh. We're going to practice like we like we did a little bit ago. Yep. Okay. Just like Daddy did to you. Yes, exactly. Just like Daddy did there. So if you want to grab onto my arm here. Oh, both. Yep. You can do that. <laughs> Abby. Oh. Because you love Jesus. Yes. Yes. And you know Jesus yes, loves you. Yes, I do, Kevin. And, yes, you do. <laughs> Yes. I, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, boys. Good morning. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Today's story is about Joshua and how God promised him victory. God tells Joshua to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. Don't be afraid, because I am with you, God says to Joshua. For six days, the army marches around Jericho. On the seventh day, they march around the city seven times. The priests blow on their ram's horns. When the, Bi when the Bible says ho um, horns in the Old Testament, they don't mean one like this. They mean one like this. Uh, 
um, back then, their horns were made out of ram's horns. It's called a shofar. A shofar can make a loud sound. The people let out a great shout, and the walls fall down flat. When the trumpet sound, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. God makes Joshua a great leader because Joshua obeys God. God promises to give us victory when we obey his word. Now listen as the choir sings, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. enjoyed the story and the song. Remember that God promises victory to all the ones who obey and follow his commandments. Let's bow your head for prayer. Dear God, thank you for all your blessings and for all the promises you give us in the Bible. Please help us to always obey your word and have victory as Joshua did. Please bless all the little boys and girls who are here and bless their family. Help us to be nice and kind as Jesus was. 
We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We have something for you to remember, the story of Joshua. Please be sure to take it before you go back with your parents. And now it's time for all of us to join in. If you can please stand and sing praises with us this morning. On this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story just begun. And there is no defining, that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. your burdens down Ooh, here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's
Till the stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame
song so much because it reminds us of what an amazing God we have. You know, you don't have to carry the burdens of the world. Just like in this song, God said he, he'll be your fourth man in the fire, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not an inch of their clothing was burnt. They didn't even smell like smoke. And just like that, God wants to be your fourth man in the fire. All you have to do is trust in him and give him any burdens, anything that you may have on your heart, and he'll know exactly how to take care of that for you. It's now time in our service where we can bring our prayer requests to the Lord. Each week, our church will pray for three families. Our goal is to eventually pray for every family in our church. This week, the families are Ruel and Portia Harvey, Keisha Norris, Kathy and Bella Cruz. And our prayer requests are, um, we would like to pray for our teachers and our students as they return back to school after spring break. Fatima Pasarak, an employee of Miriam Williamson, lost her 15-year-old daughter, Layla, in an ATV accident. We pray for the Pasarak family. The charter school Layla Pasarak attended also lost a second student who was killed in a skiing accident during spring break. We lift up this school as they mourn the loss of two of their students. Our praise reports. We are thankful all of our students traveling during spring break return back to school safely. Greg and Kristen Betla are praising God for wonderful news regarding Kristen's response to her treatments. No evidence of disease found in the pathology of the removed breast tissue and the removed lymph nodes. Therefore, Kristen is officially in remission. Praise God. Now, if you would like to come forward, if you have something in your heart, please, please feel free to come to the front as we pray. If you're in the balcony, you can feel free to come to the front um, up there as well. Um, we're now going to pray. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. an amazing what an amazing God we serve you created us you care for us you are always there for us Lord you fashioned and molded us after your likeness you sent your only son Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's cross while we were yet sinners for this, O oh Lord, we are grateful and we give you praise. To the Lord, you heard a prayer request and we bring those before you. We especially lift up before you this morning, Lord, those who lost loved ones. And we pray, God, for their comfort. We pray for peace. We also pray today, Lord, for the ministries of our church. We pray for revive for women's ministry, for Sabbath school, for children ministry, for UG, for YG. We pray, Lord, that you will bless all these ministries as they seek to bring people to the foot of the cross. We also pray for the Arlington men's um, ministry. Pray, God, that you will bless the leaders, that they will be able to impact men, boys, here at this church that they will be drawn closer to you, that we'll be able to be better husbands, that we'll be better fathers, brothers, friends, co-workers, and even leaders. We also pray for our academy, Burton. We pray for the teachers, the administrators, and all the students. We pray a special blessing upon each one of them. 
And now, Lord, we bring before you Pastor Kevin, who is going to speak to us this morning. We pray for a special outpouring of your spirit upon him. That as he speaks your words today, that our minds will be drawn closer to you. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, um, if you don't mind, and I'm sure you won't, there's just one more uh, prayer I want to offer up here in behalf of Erica Anderson. She is a friend of uh, Cherie Pence and uh, Brenda Bernardo. Uh, she's 46. Um, her bones are fracturing, she vertebra, ribs, sternum. And this week she was diagnosed with, uh, with cancer and AML. So uh, let's pray for this, uh, this friend of one of our, of a couple of our members here. So let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. And Lord, we just pray for, uh, for Erica. You know the challenge that she is facing along with those who love her and hold her dear. Just pray for your Holy Spirit to be upon her, to give her a deeper sense of your love and the ultimate healing that comes through you, knowing you, Christ Jesus. For this we pray in your name. Amen. Well, I want to say something here, and I really want you to appreciate this. I know you've heard, like, weird stuff going on with the audio and things like that. You know, kind of the, you know. Hey, we got two new boards installed. And our, our media team, those folks have been working ridiculous hours uh, trying to sort out, the, yeah, exactly. So, so I don't want anybody walking away here annoyed because some sound setting was off or something like that, you know, because obviously if you could do better, you would. So, uh, but anyway, just, just appreciate them so much. They, they do a lot of work around here, and nobody notices until you notice. And uh, trust me, if it's driving you crazy, they're off the scale crazy about it. So, but in any case, um, you know, I've got, you, you know, I'm, I'm not employed by the Arlington Church local. You know, that's how the Adventist Church works. I'm employed by the Texas Conference, and so, you know, uh, there are folks here uh, that are above me, so to speak, in the food chain that are here with us today. I'm not going to out them, so you guys don't worry about me outing you. I, don't, I, I want this to be a safe environment for you, but, <laughs> but I would have to say, um, you know what? For being able to participate in, in Abby's baptism, you don't have to pay me this month. <laughs> <laughs> you really don't. That was just... That is... Uh, you know, I, I just really appreciate that because it's been a joy to see Abby uh, grow up in this community of faith and to see her parents and how they have, uh, they've just raised her to know the Lord. And, uh, yeah, I like the fact she called me Kevin because, you know, <laughs> I, I, look, as a pastor, it's a weird deal being a pastor, you know, because I, I usually don't, I don't introduce myself as a pastor because all of a sudden people change. I get like really weird, you know, especially if they've been cussing in front of you beforehand. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my neighbor, boy, he is no. But in any case, um, <laughs> but I, I just appreciate being able to be a part of the body of Christ. You know, that is a singular privilege that's extended to any and all who would accept it. And it is a blessing to know that regardless of the circumstances we may find ourselves in in life, that there is hope in the chaos, that we are held by God. This 
is God's assurance to each and every soul, regardless of what our background is, regardless of what our, our capacities, our talents, regardless of what our wealth or our health may be. We are held by God. Now, I know there's something also kind of referencing the whole pastoral thing. It's kind of weird sometimes. You ever wonder, how do pastors come up with preaching topics? You ever wonder about that? Yeah, you wonder about that? So do I. It's kind of weird. But usually what happens is just kind of interacting with folk. You start to hear how the Spirit is moving. You start to hear how people are, are in need. And from there, you kind of get your starting point of, of, you know, that and going to the Scriptures to see what the Word says about any particular set of circumstances. I mean, it's not, it's not mysterious, but it is spiritual. But then once you kind of get on a thread you develop it, you know, from a, of a scriptural perspective. You start looking within the text and you see where does the text point me? Because that's one of the beautiful things about the scriptures is that the scriptures reinforce. From Genesis all the way through to Revelation, you can find these themes, you can find these threads. And so that's how series kind of develop. You know, it's not entirely random, but it does take some matter of looking a little bit. The reason I'm saying that is because we're going to go to a couple of places today that may not seem intuitively, or at least they may not seem just kind of on the surface to be like, how'd you get there? Well, remember last week I talked to you about, um, about Joshua and how this valiant man of God had an issue perhaps with fear because of God having to say to him on three separate occasions in one chapter, be courageous. Don't be afraid. And how the people responded by also affirming him to be courageous and to not be afraid. And then, of course, today, our, our welcome text continues on with that thread. So that's how we end up in, in Hebrews. I don't typically like to just, do a, just jump into a book and then jump someplace else because you need to study the word. You need to look at it, the text, within the context of the book, within the context of the writer's approach to a topic, and then within the context, of course, of the, of the place in which it was written. So in the book of Hebrews, we pick up here for a little bit some texts that I think are particularly important to us as we seek to understand how we're held by God. So Hebrews chapter 13, beginning of verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Okay, here is a very important point when it comes to understanding how we are held by God. Now, you're fixated on that whole angels thing. Okay, we'll deal with that in just a second. But it's more than that. Remember, as I've said to you, and you've read, and you've understood this over the years, the Bible tells us that before sin ever enters the world, before there is the catastrophe of broken relationship with God, with ourselves, and with everyone, and with the environment, when Adam is standing in the fullness of life, unencumbered, untouched by sin, God says to him, it is not good for human kind to be alone. So by God's design, we are meant to be in community with other human beings, okay? That's God's design. There's nothing deficient about that. There's nothing defective about that. There's nothing heretical about that. That is God's proclamation. You and me, we're meant to be together. And so the writer of Hebrews here, many believe it's Paul, some have suggested perhaps it was Apollos or any number of other characters, but the writer here is saying, let brotherly love continue, okay? Because this is, I would argue, perhaps the primary way through which God reveals that we are held by him. It is through the tenderness, it is through the love of flesh and blood, bone, sweat, and tears, human beings, that God prompts and moves for us to come together. And he says, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So there's kind of the bonus. Have I ever met an angel other than my wife? I'm not sure. <laughs> Where did she go? Oh my goodness. 
If you see my wife, make sure she watches the tape. But in any case, I don't know, and neither do you. But he says that there is this interface between the natural and normal and the supernatural, the spiritual. And I would say even preceding some encounter with an angel, there's something supernatural about us coming together and encouraging one another and blessing one another and loving one another. And then he goes on to say here, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. In other words, listen, you have had a rough go. Socrates is alleged to have said, be kind to every man you have meet, for he has had a difficult life. And that is true. Every person you know has had difficulties. Every person you know has had trials. Every person you know has suffered. Every one of us. And we need to be mindful of that. We need to be respectful of that as we interact with one another. Because this affords us an opportunity, as we'll see a little bit later here, to especially bless and encourage people when they are in their difficult spots. Once again, this is God's method for holding us in our times of difficulty. And so the writer goes on to say and give some counsel here uh, about the vibrancy of life in Christ. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. He makes these, this kind of a statement here to talk about the importance of stable social relations. That's what that's there. That's why that kind of seemingly just pops up randomly. Like, what's up with marriage here? You were just talking about this. Well, because it's part of the overall message. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, I want to teach you a little bit of Greek here, okay? Now, one or two of you may know if I'm saying this the right way, but most of you won't, so let's just kind of go with it, all right? Uh, Tarkas. Say it after me. Uh, Tarkas. Uh, Tarkas. Uh, Tarkas. Now, why is this term important? Because this is a term that describes a normative state for Christians to live in. And what I mean by that is that this isn't just an occasional state of living. This is a biblically prescribed, a biblical description of how God would have you to be pretty much all the time. And this also introduces us to a concept that it's, you know, a lot of folks have, especially people who are outside of Christ, have some serious misunderstandings about the nature of being in Christ, okay? One of the ways that they misunderstand being in Christ is not understanding that the teachings of Jesus sometimes are not easy to understand in your gut right off the bat. Intellectually, sure. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy as yourself. I can get that intellectually. But when it actually comes to experiencing that, that can be a challenge. I would say so it is with Autarchus, which is, as I said, a normative state for us to live, okay? Now, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Now, from here, we're going to go someplace else, and we're going to, I want to take a, I want to look for a few moments at a promise that I know pretty much the majority of you know this promise, and you have memorized this promise. And I want to 
perhaps help you to look at it in a different way and might even say to you, you have completely misunderstood this promise. And furthermore, have in all likelihood misapplied this promise, okay? Remember a few moments ago, I said there's text, there's context. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes we take something and we run with it, but God never intended for us to understand it in such a way, okay? I mean, we do this all the time with different things. We, we have a belief about something and we end up... How many people here, have you ever hurt your own feelings with your imagination? All right. You're like, you've got this whole scenario that something's going on in your mind and you just start kind of making this, spinning this thing into something. Before you know it, you're all depressed and sad and nothing has actually happened. You just made it up. Well... You know, sometimes we get upset with God because we take a promise of his and we make it say something that it never said. And when that thing doesn't come about, we're upset and we're sad because God let us down. No, you let your own self down. Now, here's this promise because, as I said, pretty much all of you know it and I can prove it to you. I did first service. All I had to do was say two words, and people were able to finish it, okay? So I'm going to give you the first word, and then I'm going to give you the second word, and I want you to say it aloud. I want you to say the rest of the promise, okay? Don't worry. Don't worry. If you're wrong, it's okay, because everybody else should be saying it, and they'll just cover you up, all right? So (laughs) here's the first word, I. Anybody want to run with that? Okay, here we go. I can. Thank you. You did not disappoint. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. That's a beautiful promise, isn't it? You know, you think about that when you were like at the beginning of the year and you decided, you know what, I'm going to run more this year. I'm going to run a marathon. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. (laughs) At about mile number 20, you start questioning Jesus' ability. (laughs) I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do this. I can get that job because I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. It sounds right, doesn't it? And no doubt you have affirmed your faith by claiming that promise. But let me point out something to you that might help you actually to look at it differently. And I would say, I would argue in a more substantive, in a deeper way, in a way that is actually more powerful than you grabbing onto that promise to get that promotion at work or you grabbing onto that promise to get you that relationship. Something much better. You know, that's how God works with us most of the time. In fact, I would say all of the time. God has something better in mind for you than you do for yourself. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this promise and see if what, uh, what I'm saying here is actually true. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Letter to the church in Philippi, Paul is writing to some folks who have, well, who have supported him in his ministry. He's writing to people that he loves. He's writing to people that have cared for him. And 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 we all know what that's like to have people in our lives that care for us. But, you know, sometimes people are in a position where they can't help. There are encumbrances. There are obstacles. There are challenges. But you know that they would if they could. Paul says in Philippians 4, chapter 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. 
He's thanking God that they are able to fulfill the desires of their hearts towards him. Eh, that's good. Hey, it's benefiting him. You'd say, yeah, of course that makes sense. But he says, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. He's glad that the, that the dam has burst and finally they're able to get through. But it's not about relieving whatever his circumstances are. Because he goes on to say here, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be autarchous. I've learned to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, that promise about being able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me is not about me overcoming some external obstacle. It is not about me getting the promotion. It is not about me getting the bigger bank account. It is not about me getting slimmer, stronger, faster, smarter, or anything else like that. Christ Jesus strengthens you so that you may be autarchous regardless of what your circumstances are, to be content. Now, notice that he says, he begins by saying, I have learned to be content even when I'm abased, meaning that even when I am aware of the fact that I'm missing stuff that I want, that I am on the margins. He is saying, I have learned to live in that place where it is truly hazardous, where there's no room for error, where I am walking on the tightrope, and if I fall this way, there is destruction, and if I fall this way, there is catastrophe, and I am just in no man's land. There's this much, if even, that separates me from disaster. Now, think about that. You may be there right now. You may be in a very real place where there is, there, it's, not, it, it's not your imagination. It's not your imagination. It's paper thin. You ever been to the zoo? You go to the primate area? You go in there and you go to that enclosure where they've got that big silverback gorilla? <laughs> you go up there and you got that glass and you're just standing at that glass and you make eye contact the wrong way with that silverback and he starts, <laughs> you know, and you ever see him, they run up, just, just Google it. You'll see it on YouTube. Some soul will be standing there, standing at the glass and all of a sudden that just silverback just rears up and boom. And you're like, that's amazing how they engineered that glass. But imagine how you would feel if that glass gave way. <laughs> From what I understand, you should not run. Stay put. Because you'll just die tired if you run. <laughs> Some of you are staring at the gorilla, and that gorilla is big and fierce and stronger than you realize, and it's real. The thing you're facing may actually be worse than your imagination. And Paul says, 
he's learned how to be content. Even facing that very real threat. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine what that's like to be able to live that way? To be content, even in the presence of disaster. Now, he balances this out on the other end of the scale, which is really where all of us want to be. But I would say it is equally hazardous when he says that I know how to abound. Well, why is that hard? Listen, I've known some ridiculously wealthy people. I mean, flat out wealthy people. And you know what? It's not all rainbows, sunshine, and puppy dog tails. The stressors. Oh, I want that kind of stress. You want to get sued by people just because they want your money? You want to have to be on top of that because you got people coming for you? You want to have to constantly go through your head whether you have done enough in the face of hardship when you have a heart? Seems like it's easy, but it ain't. Learning to be content, I think, with having much is just as hazardous, but just in a different way. And we live in a time, in a place, in a society that is almost 100% oriented against that notion of being content. You are getting bombarded all day long with the notion of not being content, not being content. It's called advertising, okay? It's called advertising. You are targeted not only by the advertisers, but by computers, algorithms, artificial intelligence. Now, okay, there are some conspiracies flat out crazy. There are other conspiracies, oh yeah, I believe it. It's gotten bad enough, you know not to talk in front of your phone about certain things, right? Right, Siri? Siri, are you there? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How can I help you? Go to sleep. Um, you know, like you search something, and all of a sudden, your ads just start going around that thing. It's gotten bad enough. I, I'm tell, you're you're going to think I'm paranoid, but I'm telling you. Has anybody else had this experience? You just thought about something. <laughs> I mean, you didn't say it out loud. You didn't Google it. You just thought about something. And all of a sudden, there's the ads for it. Okay, you think I'm crazy, unless it's happened to you. And if it hasn't happened to you, it will happen to you. And if you don't know it, that just tells me you're completely in the matrix. Okay? But even that, is explainable because these algorithms are constantly adjusting things, constantly influencing us, such that all of a sudden you find yourself wanting something you don't need. Need a new car, huh? How many of you love that new car smell? You can smell it now, can't you? You know what? You can actually buy the new car smell in a spray. <laughs> y you can. You can buy it. You, seriously, I'm not making that up. You can buy it. Of course, you know, they have suggested that the new car smell is actually a carcinogen, so enjoy the nasal cancer. But uh, 
But we have this whole ecosystem which is oriented towards the singular purpose of getting you to a place of being discontent with what you have. And it doesn't make a distinction about whether you have too much or too little. And Paul says, I have learned to be autarchous regardless of what my circumstances are. And I would say to you again, can you imagine the peace of mind and the peace of spirit if you could be in a place like that? Well, how's that possible? I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Let me suggest something to you. And, and if you don't want to do this, obviously I will never know. And if you don't want to do this, I understand. I totally, completely understand. Especially if you are in that place of being abased, that place where the glass is paper thin. Instead of praying for God to take the gorilla away, instead of praying for God to give you an overabundance, ask him to change you in the face of that. Not imagined problem, but real problem. I know that's a big ask. I know that's not easy. And I know, I don't even know what I'm asking of some of you. But I know that Jesus is promising you something greater than what you can see right now. And the only way to get the eyes to see is to take the promise. I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens me. And all things is for me to be at peace right now. Now, think about this also on the back side. Because the backside will come. The gorilla will go away. The glass will get thicker. Your margins will grow. But imagine what it will be like if your place of contentment precedes the departure of the gorilla. What it will be like if you find yourself content now when the deficit is real, rather than once everything's okay. You see, you, see, you understand spiritual discipline and growth is not about circumstances changing. It's about our hearts changing in the midst of the circumstances. And I would say to you folks that you've got plenty right now and you think maybe I'm a little bit shallow, maybe I'm a little bit not spiritual enough and I've talked to people plenty of times. So rather than thinking that the only way God can speak to you is through chopping your knees off and breaking you down, that maybe he could make you content even in the midst of much. Something to consider. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, in looking at this primary passage, I was directed to a psalm that, I mean, I've read through it before, but I'll be honest, didn't pay any attention to it. But it's a good psalm and one that I would recommend you memorize this coming week. It's only three verses long. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's pretty easy. But it says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters nor with things too profound for me. Just the simple life. Just simplicity. We make a lot of things complicated. We invest a lot of emotional, psychological energy and to trying to solve the world's problems. You know, I, I felt a lot better once I stopped becoming an expert on geopolitics, government in America, health care, and about 55 other things. Okay. Now, this is not being detached and disinterested, but it is recognizing one's actual ability to do something about something. There's only so much you can do. And he says, surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And he says that I have calmed and quieted my soul. In the Hebrew, it is my nefesh. And what is a nefesh? A nefesh is the combination of the ruach, the spirit, the breath of God, and the adama, the dirt. Coming together creates a nefesh, a living soul, and literally a throat. He says, calm down. If you can calm down, you've opened the doorway to autarkus, to being content. God wants you to be calm. He wants you to be content. And he has promised this is possible through Christ Jesus. One time, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, please teach us how to pray. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say,
Uh, that was very beautiful. I really appreciate that. Just very, very beautiful. Thank you for leading us and reminding us about our Father in heaven who loves us so very, very much and wants only the very best for us. Father God, you are good and we're all held by you. Lord, bring us nearer to your heart that we may know that no matter what our circumstances to the naked eye may be, that we are held firmly, securely in your embrace. And that through Christ Jesus, we can learn to be content, regardless of what our circumstances may be, because those circumstances are always going to change. But you, you do not change. You are eternal and you are faithful. Keep us in your grace and your spirit until that great day. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our worship now through Koinonia. It is fellowship time at the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church. God bless you. Go in peace.